You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hello and welcome to Writing Black. I am your host, Maisha Kai, lifestyle editor here at The Griot. And today we have a very special guest who is one of my colleagues here at The Griot. We have with us veteran journalist and acclaimed author and interviewer and pop culture critic, Ture, who you should know very well from the opinion pages here at The Griot, but you should also know him from his written work. Um, he has produced, he tells me, I believe, eight books. This might be the eighth, uh, which is his latest, The Ivy League Counterfeiter, which is out now on Scribd. This is a short form book, uh, so it's a briefer format than you might be used to, but it is an amazing, complex, nuanced really gripping story about a real life figure and Tere is here to tell us all about it. Welcome Tere. Thank you for having me. That was a lovely intro. Appreciate it. Well, you know, it's all true and I'm sure I left some things out, so please forgive me. Um, but you know, we don't get we have not hosted uh, our many of our colleagues here <laughs> the Creo, so this is exciting for me uh to talk to somebody who I see in in those slack streets and, you know, when we're out and about, but this is the other work you do when you're not writing opinion pieces for the Griot, you are writing other things. And this story, uh, you know, it's a short form book is is my understanding of this format on Scribd. Um, And you are one of a wave of authors uh, lately to kind of take to this format. And I'm really enjoying it. My cousin, Keith Boykin, who was also a guest on the show, recently released something on Scribd as well. That is my cousin. That is my my cousin. He is the best. (laughs) But yeah, so, you know, it's very fun to see people kind of working with these new formats and people getting to engage with your work in a whole new way. I mean, this is obviously um, a different and somewhat more digestible format, I think, for a lot of people. You know, it's a clocks in about 80 pages. Um, and it is the story of Cliff Evans, who is an absolutely fascinating figure who you happen to know personally. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Ivy League counterfeiter? Yeah, I mean, you know, I knew this brother Cliff Evans in high school. We went to private school together in New England and Massachusetts. He had come from the streets of Chicago, was one of those people you would not have forgotten. Some people you went to high school with, you may not remember. Mm -hmm. There's a couple people who like everybody would remember. Cliff was one of those guys. He was funny. He was aggressive. He talked really fast. He was a football star. He made sure everybody knew that he was a tough guy from Chicago. Now, Mm -hmm. in high school, we weren't really sure how much of that to believe, but we weren't going to test him to figure it out. He went on to (laughs) Columbia, um, where he also quickly made sure everybody knew that he was a tough guy. And again, he was a football star. But at Columbia, they didn't doubt that he was telling the truth because he was running all kinds of little scams. Remember in high school, in college, they were handing out credit cards to anybody who could sign their name. He would get lots and lots of people to sign up, give him the card. So while they could prove I was over here, he was over here buying stuff with the card. They would call and say, my card was stolen. And the two of you split up a bunch of free merchandise. Some people who are listening to this might have said, yeah, somebody on my campus did that two or three times. Cliff did this like 30, 40, 50 times, like a lot. Cliff Evans sat in his Harlem apartment smoking a blunt near stacks and stacks of counterfeit 20s, unaware that in the hallway outside, several plainclothes federal officers were in position just waiting for the moment to bust in and arrest him. Like, And they were like, He's always into some hustle. He was one of the biggest weed salesmen on campus. And toward the end of his time at Columbia, he found a copier. And somebody said, this copier is perfect, a photocopier. And he put a dollar on the machine, and it came back perfectly. And he told me later... Right then, I knew exactly what to do. And he, like, saw the steps that he needed to take to become a professional counterfeiter. This lasted, this is 1996, and this lasted for a good little while. Um, 
he and I don't want to give away the whole story because I want your no your definitely don't to be able yeah. to listen because you know it's a true crime story and those don't usually end well and uh, they don't this was one of yeah. them but one of the questions that I'm really trying to interrogate here is why did this happen because he mm-hmm. had an extraordinary life opportunity he's one of the people we both know many people who came from the hood or a tough situation got into some amazing prep school some amazing private school new york you know new jersey new england what many places and got an opportunity in life and i know a lot of people like that who are thriving at you know law firms goldman sachs doctors this and that whatever And then there's a couple people who did not take it as far as they could have. And you think about why you knew all the opportunities that happen. And, you know, if you stay on this path that you get to there, you could see it right through the through the parents, through the the teachers, through the through the alums. You see it. And yet and still he still insisted on going the criminal route. And so I'm trying to explore why that is. And like I said, like you said, yeah. Cliff was a friend of mine. And after he got out of prison, we sat on his mother's stoop in Chicago and talked about what happened and why for you know, like a whole many, many hours. Um, and so I had a deep understanding of what happened. Uh, however, after I left him, he went into a whole nother criminal conspiracy. Which is- <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that in a second because yeah. I'd want to get into this why too because I, I have I have some thoughts for sure. Okay. Um, but we're going to be right back to talk more about Cliff Evans, the Ivy League counterfeiter, with our friend Tere, with more writing black. All right, Tere, we were just talking about. Uh, this incredible story of yours, uh, the Ivy League counterfeiter. I mean, it's your story. It's also Cliff Evans' story, obviously. And your rendering of it is, you know, I, I want to talk about uh, craft for a minute because I think your rendering of the story is so effective um, and so gorgeously written. So I, I wanted to shout out <laughs> your, your writing style on this um, because this story could have been told a lot of ways. There was something very intimate to me personally about this middle class kid who, to your point, you know, had it wasn't that he was lacking examples. He wasn't a child who had no examples of successful or upright or even striving people in his life. I mean, they may not have been a rich family, but his mother owned a popular beauty salon. His father was, you know, worked his way to be a lieutenant in Chicago police. And then there's his brother. (laughs) friends say cliff looked up to his brother and spoke of him with an air of reverence cliff admired his brother's street cred and wanted that for himself i got his hustler good qualities he said my brother is a horse and i'm a horse that's slang for i'm a thoroughbred i was bred to be like this so there's something there to be said about who are who who we choose as our heroes right and that, to me, was such a strong chord that you, you know, when we talk about the writing of this story, one of the things that struck me is that as much as it was this recounting of this really incredible, untold, largely unknown um, figure, it, uh, there was a bit of allegory there, right? <laughs> like, you know, in terms of um, and, and some archetypes as well. Um, was that something really intentional for you? Was it something that just kind of revealed itself as you were writing the story? I don't think you start by saying, is this going to be boy meets girl or stranger goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town, a hero goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town? Which one is it going to like, you don't do that, right? You kind of know those are, that's the core of what most stories are. One Mm -hmm. of those three arcs. And you sort of start pursuing the story on your own. I mean, I knew I had a super compelling, charismatic, central character. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to draw as much um, clarity around who he was. And even though I knew him, I didn't know 
I, I didn't know everything about him. I didn't know him that well when he was at Columbia and he's actually doing all this stuff. I didn't know what he did after he got out of prison. So there was a lot of real reporter work in terms of mm -hmm. finding yeah. Columbia friends yeah. and like finding one and, hey, you know, who else can you introduce me to? And then that person, and like as a reporter, you always want to like let one person lead you to the next person, lead you to the next person. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of interviews around his Columbia community. Some people told me things that turned out to be wrong. Some people gave me interviews that turned out to be useless. However, at the end, they said, you know, you really should talk to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And that person was a gold mine. There was de it was definitely like getting closer to the truth. And part of the thing you do as a journalist is you're like, what do I believe? Do I believe that or do I believe this? Which makes more mm -hmm. sense? And sometimes as a journalist or a historian, you have to make those sort of choices and you don't want to make them recklessly um but you know again the whole thing if you have a compelling central character the whole thing can sprawl around that what does this crazy character do in a crazy situation and right. you know you have somebody who has street wise ness and a desire to be part of the underworld plus Ivy League education and training, and they find a niche that isn't really violent, that doesn't require them to hurt people. For a decade, Cliff had been molded by teachers at one of America's greatest prep schools and then at an Ivy League university. But all that work was flushed down the toilet the night he decided to run a criminal enterprise built around distributing money that came from a photocopier. And I interviewed other counterfeiters. They're like, you know, it, it feels like a victimless crime because the real victim is the general economy and the government. So who's really like, you know, who's really mad that you stuck it to the government? I mean, they people feel like, yo, I got over on them, right? Because by the time they figured out your money was fake, you're gone. But I actually did find a friend of mine was paid in this fake money. So he goes to Con Ed the next day to pay his bill. And he's like, so here's, you know, $80. And she's like, okay, okay, okay. No, this one's fake. And he's like, what are you talking about? That one's, what do you, what do you mean? I mean, can you imagine if you handed somebody some money and they were like, this bill is fake. And my friend was like, I really couldn't see it until she pointed it out. And even then I was kind of like, is it? I don't know. He couldn't really, really tell. Cliff had worked really hard on finding the paper, on giving texture well, to the paper, on creating yeah. color. Those things are very, very difficult to do. Well, I, I also think it's difficult to track down counterfeiters. And I want to talk about how you did that, because I think like you just dropped some journalistic gems in terms of how you research a story. But that was one aspect that I found myself like, how did you find these people and get them to talk? And we're going to talk about it as soon as we come back with more Writing Black. All right, we are back with more Writing Black and with our friend, Tere, our colleague here at The Grio. Uh, Tere has written uh, an amazing story called The Ivy League Counterfeiter. It is uh, the latest of his many, many published works. And this one is fascinating. It's about a real life character, Cliff Evans, who uh, literally did counterfeit in the Ivy League. And you found in the process of researching this book, you found more than one counterfeiter to talk to you about process and nuance and the and the politics of it and the morals of it which I just thought was so I'm like you know how did you how do you even go about like what what network do you tap into to get the counterfeiters to, to talk to you like what, who are those friends I mean it's a great question you know part of the that's a great question part of the thing is that criminals like to tell their story they also understand on the other side of their brain, they should not tell their story. Right. So if you can give them that space in which they can talk their shit and like, <laughs> yo, you've seen how I killed it on these, right? Because if you play basketball or you write a book or whatever, you, you know, you throw down in the kitchen, you can tell people like, yo, I'm 
great at making chicken or playing spades or playing basketball, or whatever. If you kill it as a criminal, like you gotta keep it to yourself. Like you rarely get the chance to be like, yo, let me tell you how badass I was, how much I. <laughs> so, you know, if you can get a criminal, a working criminal, and you really, he trusts you and he can, and he knows you're not gonna give up his name and you're not gonna give up him or her, they can talk to you. And, you know, so, I mean, like, if there's somebody who knows you, mm-hmm. just like you in a drug deal, Maisha, if somebody can vouch for you, he's not the popo. He says it like I would know. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I'm a wholesome uh, girl from the south side of Chicago, like Michelle Obama. I do not know what you are referring to, <laughs> sir. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, if you can just convince them somehow that you are cool, like you're not going to give them up, you're not the police or whatever, they'll tell you some things. And I definitely had some professional counterfeiters who told me some really, really interesting things about the making of the money, about the, the mm-hmm. process of spending the money. You remember that movie Brewster's Millions? The Absolutely. Parker. I love that you made that reference because I was like, yeah. that was such a Gen X reference to me and I was so here for it. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, Brewster's Millions for, for the millennials listening, um, he, he, his, his uncle or something is dying and he says, you know, I'm going to give you, let's say, $100 million to spend and you have to have nothing to show for it. And if you do that in a certain amount of time, I'll give you a billion. And I'm, I'm messing up these numbers, but like, right. you know, it's like, I'm gonna give you a gigantic amount of money. And if you do this, you do this game for me, you're gonna have a, an, an insane amount of money. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. He inherited it. If you can do it, you get 300 million. But if you fail, don't get you see quickly within that movie and within the process of counterfeiting that constantly spending money on things you don't really, really want or need gets really tiresome. I mean, I think all of us who spend sometimes we have like that sort of retail therapy thing that we can like mm-hmm. be made to feel better because we bought something cool or whatever. Keep doing that. And after like 100 or 200 times of doing that, you're going to be like, this is not fun. And like just sort of having to get rid of money becomes draining. And then you have all this money, can't buy a house, can't buy anything big, can't buy anything lasting. So then what are you going to do with all the money that you've accrued from counterfeiting? It's it's tricky. And yet they're like, this is one of the biggest criminal industries in America. Yeah, that was amazing. That was amazing. Um, we're going to get into more of the Ivy League counterfeiter and more with Tere, uh when we return with more Writing Black. All right, we are back with more Writing Black and Tere, who has written the Ivy League counterfeiter. We are we were just discussing the whole counterfeit industry and what a major like I don't think most people think of counterfeiting as like in the top three. And I thought you made a really great point about that in the book. If you don't mind repeating it here, why that is like, why we don't know that. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, it's actually really, really interesting because uh, counterfeiters talked about drug dealing being number one criminal enterprise in America, prostitution number two in terms of the size of the industry and counterfeiting being number three. And yeah, you notice that, Whenever they make a drug deal, they they lay out all the bags and all the money and all the guns. They want you to know we caught a three million, a ten million, a thirty million dollar drug mm-hmm. ring, and we stopped them. And blah blah blah. You didn't stop anything, but anyway, um, with counterfeiting, it's a little bit different because the authorities understand we want to stop counterfeiting, but even worse than counterfeiting happening is people losing faith in the American dollar. If mm-hmm. people thought 5% of every uh, bill out there was fake, then the, the faith in the US economy and the dollar would take a beating. And losing that would be worse for everybody. Yeah. So they're trying to stop counterfeiting while also saying, nothing to see here, folks, no big deal. It's all they're all small rings. It's nothing. No, don't worry about it. You know, your money is fine. You're you know, so I mean, 
they don't they don't want to have some bust where they're like, look, we found two million dollars in counterfeit money. Like they like let's let's. But then that's like the wildest thing because of course it is a big deal. I mean. George Floyd was stopped over a counterfeit bill, right? You know, it is a big deal. (laughs) Did we ever actually establish that he knew that it was a counterfeit bill? No, we did not. We did not establish that. So that's definitely not what I'm inferring. (laughs) That word word got thrown out. I was curious as a person who'd done a bunch of research into counterfeiting, like, did that word got thrown around? Did he know that it was counterfeit? Right, if because he, if there's that many circulating around, that means the odds are most of us have handled one, right? <laughs> you know, it's like at some point, some you know, no matter how small or large the domination, you may or may not have encountered one. And then what, right? I mean, the government would be horrified to hear you thinking. Almost everybody has had a counterfeit bill at some point. Like we, like no, we don't want that anybody thinking that at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is one to me. That was one of the stunning revelations of this of of many of many. I mean, I cannot again. I cannot impress enough on our listeners how much is packed into this eighty page. I devoured this book like in oh, one yeah. sitting, and then I went back. And I was like, "What did I just read?" And then I read a portion aloud to my boyfriend. Like, you got to hear this part. Like, and we're going to talk about that part actually when we come back uh, with more writing black and more from Tere. All right, we are back with more writing black and Tere, my colleague here at the Grio. And we are talking about his newest work, The Ugly Counterfeiter. And, um, you know, one of the things we touched on earlier, Ture, was this idea of archetypes. And, I, you know, we were talking about the why, the why of somebody like Cliff Evans, who, you know, I think to the person who just works on surface, maybe maybe the, the your average racist even, you know, it's so easy to flatten a figure like this and and, you know, talk about him is being like depraved or whatever, whatever. Um, When he's really obviously highly intelligent, highly um, driven (laughs) in what he chose to do, (laughs) you know, Um, very dynamic. But there is a rush clearly that he is looking for from a certain type of success, right? And, you know, we were talking earlier about who you choose as your heroes. And there is another character in this book that stood out to me so sharply. And I came back to him again and again, and I don't know why. Um, Because you're really using him for context, I believe. But there is this character, and I hope I get his name right. Was it it Randall? Was his name Randall or Ronda? Oh, Randall. Randall Dunn. Randall Dunn. Thank you. Randall Dunn, who is one of uh, your schoolmates uh, at Milton Prep. and Academy. Milton Academy, excuse me. And... um, Randall Dunn is this young man who confronts the insult of being told that he's landed someplace because of affirmative action. And you have a very nuanced um, approach to explaining that, explaining why, yes, that is true. Um, But it just, oh, it it was so striking to me because, again, I think he represents another archetype you know that kid who we don't know his background actually i don't think you give us that um we know that cliff came in through a better chance for all we know randall you know yeah has well-to-do parents we don't know randall's story is really powerful it's actually the story i tell in this book i lived through um and i also talked about in my book about what it means to be black who's afraid of post-blackness that story has been so so resonant for me um And it kind of gets at the way that no matter how much we achieve, no matter how great our resume may be, there will always be a white person who will say, oh, maybe it's just affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And they use that as a cudgel to say, you're not worthy of your achievements rather than, you know, uh, yeah, it's affirmative action because a generation ago, no matter how great our parents were, we were not getting into Harvard and Brown, Stanford, et cetera. And now we are. So if you just level the playing field, then we have a chance. But no, you know, part of the big thing with um, Milton was where you got into college. And Randall Dunn was an extraordinary student, an extraordinary person, um, varsity in three sports, like A's across the board. 
everyone looked at the black students as the ones taking slots we supposedly didn't deserve. Which brings us to the story of Randall Dunn. Randall Dunn was five years older than me and an amazing teenager. He was popular, charismatic without even trying, and a great athlete. He made varsity in football, basketball, and lacrosse. Everyone looked up to him. When he was a senior, he was head monitor, a position that some other schools might refer to as senior class president. Students voted on who got the job. Dunn was the first black head monitor in the history of Milton. Despite being, you know, great grades, great recommendations, three sport varsity athlete, president of the school in his senior year, he gets into Brown and someone says, well, you just got in because of affirmative action. And instead, and he's such an extraordinary person that instead of beating that kid up, which he surely could have, or verbally snapping on him, which he surely could have, he went to the morning assembly where all in the 80s, Milton was separated by gender. So all the boys from ninth to 12th grade would meet together in the morning and all the girls from ninth to 12th grade would meet in another big room. Um, he came to that assembly and said, you know, somebody said you only got into Brown because of affirmative action. Didn't even name the person. So he's sparing him the direct shame, right? And like the people in the dorm surely heard and knew like, oh, that mm -hmm. was Tim. And Tim's always saying some fucked up shit. But like, you know, he's just saying like, you know, this was said, it's inappropriate. You know, everybody knows how hard I work to get here. And, you know, like you really shouldn't do that to people. And he, he, his presentation was very calm. It was not angry at all. It was very powerful. Um, it still sticks in my spirit uh, decades mm -hmm. and decades later. Um, but the notion that, you know, that Randall had succeeded so wildly at Milton and still they're like, it's just affirmative action. And I'm like, I could not possibly hope to put together a high school resume like Randall's. And I didn't, mm -hmm. couldn't have. Um, so I'm like, well, surely they're looking at me like, well, you're just, you know, it's just affirmative action, which is a way of minimizing us and our abilities right. and our accomplishments of otherizing us. Uh, you know, we could continue going down the rabbit hole in terms of, you know, when they say, where are you really from? Because you're not right, really right. from here, right? Yeah. Which is like otherizing, minimizing. Well, it also made me really think of, you know, that thing that we all get, all of us kids get taught, all of us black children, that we have to be that much better. Yes. And then it still doesn't count. Because all I can also think is that one of the things that stuck out to me about that is, is that, he, you know, while he, yes, would have been fully entitled to react to that insult, part of the way that he actually did respond is also the reason he had gotten that far. Like that, you know, it's like, it's all, it's all a pace with, with, mm -hmm. with, with that particular archetype of, of who he needed to be. But, it, you know, I just found it so, I, I found that so striking. It was such a striking story. And I want to talk more about this story in just a second when we come back with more Writing Black. We are back with more Writing Black uh, and our friend Teray, who has written The Ivy League Counterfeiter. Um, this is a, a short form book now out on Scribd. If you didn't know, it's pronounced Scribd and not Scribd. And uh, Teray, we were just talking about um, one of the ancillary characters in this story about Cliff Evans. Um, but, you know, it always does come back to Cliff, obviously. Um, and this this tragic kind of anti-hero of yours <laughs> you know you talked you, you made reference earlier to the hero's journey and I thought it was um an interesting reference you know it's one that we're told in one way or another makes its way into every book whether we intend it to or not and I don't know I think I do see a hero's journey in, in Cliff's story this really I mean however tragically it ends there's not a resolution necessarily but <laughs> it's, you know. there's a moment of let's say familial betrayal mm -hmm. that when you come to that part of the story the audience is like oh, no that he's uh, stabbed in the back 
by somebody very close to him that you're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't believe that happened. But, but you can't, right? Because there's no honor amongst thieves, right? You know, um, it's interesting that you, you know, the whole time I was reading this book, like I said to you earlier, the whole time I was reading this, I was like, this has to be optioned for something. Like, there's no way, like, this is such a screen worthy story. Thank is you. that something, are you at liberty to say, is this something that you are working on? I mean, no, I mean, I'm dying to make this into something visual for television, um, starting to work on that, starting to visualize how that would be and what that would look like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're just starting to navigate the thicket of, of a, a, you know, basically agents and managers and producers and who can take it on. Um, you know, somebody said to me, this is a great story, but it's not a redeeming story. Right. So, and, I'm like, and they're like, it's not an uplifting story. And I'm like, well, this is true, but every story doesn't have to be. I'm going to say, does it need to be? <laughs> and like, you know, it's, it's black opportunities to make these sort of projects are still so infrequent right more frequent now than ever but relative to the entire world less mm -hmm. frequent um that we still want representation to be positive we still want to tell a story that we can say okay this has some redeeming value and i can show this to children or young people and say look and the woman king look at the the black mm -hmm. man who fought through the privation to make it look mm -hmm. at this and then you know somebody comes up and they're like yeah i want to tell a story about a counterfeiter <laughs> listen some of the best stories out right now we got we got a series about a, about a strip club down in the valley we got you know we have a godfather up in harlem we got listen sometimes the streets is just the streets the it just streets, is what it is the streets is so interesting <laughs> To talk about, I'm like, let's talk about, and you know, part of and the as thing, you see, you can take you can take a brother out the street sometimes, <laughs> right? Go take it with them. <laughs> if you if you are close to people who went to one of these highfalutin private schools, or you are somebody who went to that, you know, part of what they teach is a sense of intellectual superiority. You walk out of there feeling like I'm one of the smartest people in the world. I'm one of the smartest people in the room. And you kind of have to learn a certain humility after that, which is, you know, that they're not really teaching you that. Right. And and it's not like they just tell you, like, be arrogant. You're the smartest people in the world. But, you know, everybody's telling you, oh, my God, you go to Milton Academy, you go to Phillips Andover, you go to, you know, Exeter, you go to, you know, Northfield Mount Hermon. Oh, my God. Like, you know, and all the colleges are fighting for you. And like, you know, you feel a superiority. Mm -hmm. I think this brother definitely thought going into the criminal underworld, I'm smarter than all these and right, and he, street may not, right. he may not have fully even articulated it in his mind, but in his spirit, yo, I'm Milton Academy and Columbia University. I'm smarter than all you. Just because you did not go to the greatest schools in America does not mean you are dumb. You could be brilliant and not have and not have dro have dropped out of whatever single number grade. Uh, absolutely. So if you think just because I got this and this degree, I'm smarter than him, like absolutely not, especially he's coming from, you know, the University of the corner of Lenox Avenue, like he might run circles around you or she might run circles around you, you know, in a in a criminal enterprise or, or whatever, in a business context, whatever. But we who go to schools are taught to have this superior superiority. So I think that he may have been sort of suffused with that a little bit. First of all, I'm, I promise you, it's also, it was the combination of, now I have the greatest education that my money didn't have to buy and I have these street smarts. But then there's also the part that his mother talks about, which is, you know, we always talk about, 
you know, in the black community, well, if you can't see it, you don't believe it, you know, and he's mm. seeing this wealth, he's seeing this stuff. And, you know, maybe one, you know, is like, okay, I don't have the generational thing. I'm never going to get that. So how am I going to, yeah. And the fact is, let's be really honest. A lot of their ancestors were robber barons too. So, <laughs> you know, so he, he wasn't totally, he wasn't totally off base in terms of his approach. But, you know, also <laughs> he, he had a foot in the criminal underworld in yeah. terms of being a significant uh, marijuana salesman at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. So that made it hard for him to be cool with like, okay, sure, I can go do this job and get yelled at right. and make $40,000 or I can keep doing that and make, or I you can know, print $40,000. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> weed, I think, the weed might've been bringing in six figures easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like, I, you know, I'm chilling, I'm doing it on my own time, you know, over here it's harder you know, I mean, you know, but he talked about seeing the hustlers as a child mm -hmm. and the power, the, the, the strength that they exuded, the whole thing of like, I'm making it without any sacrifices, without the getting up early, getting dressed, traveling to a space you may or may not want to be in, all those sacrifices that a lot of us make on a daily basis, getting yelled at by a boss or a direct reporter or whatever. And the hustler is like, yo, I got all the money. I do whatever I want, whenever I want. That is very attractive. And most of us see the massive risk involved in being that figure. And then a couple are like, you know, a couple out of every thousand are like, you know what? I can beat it or I have no other options. So I'm just right. going to be that anyway and I'll take it as it comes. And, you know, right. I know I'll go away at some point or I get killed at some point, but it is what it is. He said he couldn't see himself working at the post office for the rest of his life. He thought that was a perfectly fine job for someone else, but he wanted to leave a mark. I wanted Rolling Stone to be writing articles on me, he told me. And I knew I wasn't going to get what I wanted if I stayed there in Chicago. So I took off and I said I wasn't going back till I got to where I needed to be. He paused. My brother taught me how to make it out here. You know, I, I actually, I do want people to really read this story. I think, you know, again, aside from the story itself, the way that it's told is, is so effective and, and so gripping like it's stuck with me for days so you know guys yeah. whoever's listening i want you to look on scribd find the ivy league counterfeiter it is there for you it is great um do not wait for it to come on tv <laughs> Thank you. It's so good. Uh, Tere, this is the part of the show we always ask people, and I think especially from you, this should be fascinating, so I can't wait to, no pressure. Um, no pressure. We always ask our guests, who inspires you? Like, who do you read? You know, we were just talking about the Hustlers inspiring Cl Cliff, but who were the voices, who are the voices, um, who inspire you? Like, what are you reading? What What do you maybe return to for inspiration? I don't know. Um, in no particular order, uh, I think about James Baldwin, Greg Tate, mm -hmm. Joan Didion, Toni Morrison, and Ralph Ellison. And like reading their sentences and reading how they told the story and what details and what rhythm and pacing of the sentences and, you know, like a magician, like what you show and what you hide and when you decide to show something and the arc of a story. Um, I was definitely huge Morrison uh, fan from early on. Um, I was such a Ralph Ellison fan that bef years before this fairly not good collection you know the second novel that was sort of cobbled together by somebody else mm -hmm. there's about 10 or so pieces of the second novel that were in different literary journals in the 70s so i figured out a way of like getting all of those and i read all of those and there's some extraordinary storytelling there 
Um, he, you know, Allison was just a master. Mm -hmm. uh, Baldwin sentences, just, you know, gorgeous and his description and the power and, um, you know, and Didion also huge, hugely mm -hmm. important figure in me learning how to write. Um, and, you know, my friend Greg Tate, I read uh, Flyboy and the Buttermilk a hundred times and all those pieces are, you know, his work, he would talk about music in a way that was musical and artful in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to figure out, like, this is not descriptive. This is art on its own. And how do we get to that? Um, you know, I, I mean, everybody who sort of came up in music in the generation after Greg was like, okay, so that's Michael Jordan and we'll always be chasing him. And there's just no way that you could hope to be number two, but mm -hmm. you can never hope to be ahead of him. Um, and, and, you know, he was just an extraordinary person as well. First of all, we could, we definitely, us two Gen Xers from New York in a certain era, I could talk about that all day, Hell but yeah. more than anything, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I think, again, I think you might be our first colleague on Writing Black. I could be wrong, but a little, gri little in-house griot love here, and we are happy to share it. Yeah. Um, again, you guys, go check out the Ivy League Counterfeiter on Scribd with Tere. And Tere, thank you so much for joining us on Writing Black. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We will be back in a minute with more Writing Black. All right, let's get back into it. Welcome back to Writing Black. Now, this is the part of the episode I always love, which is when I recommend to you some books based on the author we just spoke to. We like to call it My Favorites. This week, you know, it's very impossible for me to think about Tere without thinking about music and music criticism and music journalism. And, you know, one of the books that came out this year that I, I hope people engage with, but I don't know if it got enough love, was this uh, biography of Whitney Houston called Didn't We Almost Have It All by Garrick Kennedy, forward by Brandy. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot of buzz about the Whitney movie coming out. It's a great time to re-engage with her and her story. And if you can, her incredible voice, tis the season to put on The Preacher's Wife. I say get into it. But also, you know, Tere, uh was totally on point when he talked about the impact of Greg Tate. Greg Tate was one of the greatest pop culture uh, writers, essayists, critics of our generation of a generation um maybe of several um and this is his landmark book fly boy in the buttermilk an eye-opening collection of essays and there's a foreword here by henry lewis gates jr um this is his seminal work uh you know the, of a man who was not just talking about music was a musician himself um really had some of the most uh thought-provoking insights and ideas about um, pop culture, and particularly black culture, um, that I think will remain relevant for uh, hopefully for generations to come. And so uh, a salute a year after his death to Greg Tate. And this is a great gift and a great read for yourself. So bye too. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard.